Today we're going to learn how to apply a circular hexabot external fixator to correct a distal varus tibia deformity. This kind of deformity can occur um, from growth arrest due to infection, due to trauma. It can be caused as well to a malunion from a fracture. There's actually a lot more um, etiologies and causes, but this particular one uh, depicts a growth arrest. To be noted that this tibia also has a proximal deformity that we're going, going to ignore for this video. If we start by talking a little bit about the particularities of this system, we are going to use today two 155 full rings, one distally and one proximally. And because we have this nice straight diaphysis, that, and it is very easy to, to apply a ring orthogonal to this diaphysis, we're going to use a proximal reference. Now to be noted that the rings do not have in this particular system to be orthogonal to the bone. However, for added stability and for cosmesis and aesthetics, we are going to do this. There's also other options, so there's definitely no soft tissue envelope for this uh, saw bone. However, should your patient have voluminous calves, you can always take bigger rings. They have options ranging from 130 up to 230 uh, millimeters. They actually also have 270 millimeter rings. If you had to extend the fixer to the foot, you could, ha you could use arches made out of carbon fiber. You could, have arch you could use arches made out of aluminum. You could use two thirds ring. And finally, you could use foot rings. The best way to start, start applying an external fixer in a metaphyseal region is by suspending it with a wire or orthogonal or perpendicular to the desired mechanical axis. In this case, we'll consider that we want to reach an LDTA, a lateral distal tibial angle, of about 90 degrees. And the easiest way to do this is to insert this wire parallel to the joint line. Should you have a fibula, and because we're most likely going to have to distract a little bit this, uh, this bone to correct the deformity, we need to transect the distal tibiofibular joint to avoid subluxation during lengthening. So let's start by loading our wire and applying it orthogonal to the joint. This is easy because I have no soft tissues, but intraoperatively, you could use, you should use fluoroscopy to make sure that your wire is inserted parallel to the joint. So this is close enough to parallel to the joint. So we're going to accept it. Now you have two choices. You could put the ring at the bottom, if you do not need to see the joint in, or, in order not to obscure the area of deformity correction. However, if you need to see the joint and you don't need to see what's happening above, you could actually put the ring above and that would allow you to look at the joint really well during, uh, during follow-up. However, here, because we're correcting a distal metaphysis deformity, we are going to put the ring at the bottom. So I'll ask my assistant to help me attach the, this ring using wire fixation bolts. It should always be the role of the surgeon to hold the ring while the assistant's attached. In a real life situation, you need to take into account uh, the patient's soft tissue. So now we will grab the wrenches, tighten one side, if you notice this particular system uses this wrench as a counter torque tool that inserts directly into 
this bolt. So you only need this wrench and a regular spanner wrench. Now that you're attached on one end, you can have an assistant hold the ring and we use this, um, this wire tensioning tool which also has a counter torque. You make sure it's fully open and the counter torque inserts and you can tension your wire to your desired tension. In a full ring we like to tension it up to 130 kilograms before taking the wrench and tighten it carefully. All right, so you can see that this ring is pretty orthogonal to the joint. Now, this particular system also has carbon fiber rings that would allow you during follow-up to see every structure that you need, um, even through x-ray. We are going to now fix the rings in the sagittal plane, and let me try to give you a, a good view there, in the sagittal plane by suspending another wire. If we want to be perfectly orthogonal um, to the distal portion, then we should, uh, do, uh, we should apply about nine degrees of divergence between the joint line and the ring. However, you're all also committed by the soft tissues. So in this particular system, you can cheat. And let me try to give you a good view of that sagittal plane. You can cheat the sagittal plane to clear the soft tissues of the foot. We're going to insert the second wire now from posterior medial, being very mindful, mindful that the neurovascular bundle is right behind it. So we have to be careful to anterolateral. Once again, you have to be mindful that the neurovascular bundle will be or may be in your way and you have to actually you have to actually make sure to avoid it and be anterior to it in a safe position now when the wire doesn't come out exactly on top of the wire you have to use a wrench and displace it the closest side and we'll do the same thing here where we will suspend that ring and we can verify here close enough so we're going to attach it with wire fixation bolts It's important to always hold the rings when tightening to avoid shearing and displacement of, of the wire and imparting tension on the wire. Yeah. Now we're going to tension the wire using the tensioning device. Some people will avoid t tensioning the first wire and will tension both wires at once to avoid uh, taking into account the formation of the, of the ring. So we tension up to 130 kilograms, we hold the wire tensioning tool and we tighten that bolt. So now at this stage what I like to do is to cut the wires about three finger breadths away and curl them. And that avoids your assistance uh, from puncturing their gloves, their hands, or the sterile field. Some people will instead break off the wire directly from the from the ring and it's really surgeon's choice. The beauty of keeping some wire is that should there be any issue, you can uncurl it 
and use the wire again reposition something or tension it so we're going to curl the tip 90 degree and then curl the rest of the wire and try to go into a hole just like this to protect this from rubbing so we're going to do that for all four sides In a clinical context, in a patient, you want these two wires to be as close as to 60 degrees of angle to each other, but in this situation, they're not. So an option would be um, to add another wire that would add to 60 degrees, or you could even position uh, by avoiding the anterolateral structures and avoiding the tibialis anterior, add a, a half pin from it from uh, anterior to posterior which we will do this uh, ring is stable enough it's orthogonal to the to the joint line or close enough so what we're going to do is we're going to start suspending our proximal ring so we have minimal fixation first to keep our real estate here I'm going to try to use all medium struts and the middle of the scale of the middle scruts for this particular system is 160 millimeters. So what I'm going to do is measure 160 millimeters from there, which would lead up to here. And I will try to get my first ring, my proximal ring, at that level right here. So a good way to do that is to mark the skin of your patient and we'll apply our first spin of the proximal ring from anterior to posterior because we know that if that pin is positioned straight in the middle from anterior to posterior we will avoid the two struts that will take off obliquely from there. Now, because we're doing deformity correction here, we do not want to have a very short working distance. We do not want to have a pin that's very close to the osteotomy. So this particular system has multiple options to suspend pins. You have these threaded rods with movable pin fixation holders, and they come in multiple lengths. So you have different options. In addition, one could use threaded rods and clamps. Depending on what you, you want, you can adjust the height of the pins that you want. And here we, we want to get a good working distance. So we will put it about halfway. To do that, we position a nut right here. And we'll suspend into the ring first. So this is about, this is going to be about the, po the position of the pin. So we'll also mark the position of the pin approximately here. And that will give us a nice working distance between um, the osteotomy and that first pin. To position a ring orthogonal with a half pin in the diaphysis, it is very simple. All you have to do is to position the first pin that we will pre-drill perpendicular to the axis of the bone. I'm going to try to do it as orthogonal as possible. So we go straight from anterior to posterior. And here, we, we're using the foot forward as our anterior to posterior position. We need to avoid as well, make sure the tibialis anterior at that point is not in our way. For this example, we're going to use regular shen screws. However, um, in a clinical patient for a fixer that will stay for months, you want to use hydroxyapatite coated pins for better integration in the bone. And we insert this pin in the same axis. There you go. You want to have a couple threads. And let's try to show it a couple threads behind. And obviously in a, in a patient you would use uh, fluoroscopy to confirm your positioning. Now, now that the spin 
is orthogonal to the diaphysis and directly anterior to posterior, what is left to do is to place the ring and we're going to attach it directly in the center. Now you have to be mindful of soft tissue clearance and the calf typically is posterior lateral. So you have to make sure that you have enough soft tissue clearance in that area. So let's position another nut. So first we're going to tighten that clamp to the ring. And now we're going to tighten on the clamp. So you can first start it by hand. Now on fluoroscopy, you, you can verify that your ring is orthogonal. If the threaded rod portion is collinear with the tibia, that would work. Here we can see that our ring is not very well centered. So because I only have one pin, because all this is mobile, I can still correct a little bit. So we'll just loosen the nut some. We'll readjust it and please retighten it. Good. So there's still a certain level of play, but you can see that this ring is pretty well orthogonal to the tibia. Once again, this system doesn't require the, the, the rings to be completely orthogonal, but we try to do it anyways. So now to, to finish adjusting the, uh, this ring orthogonal to the, to the bone, um, you can see that in the other plane, it is not completely orthogonal you would have to adjust the swivel clamp. So let's loosen that swivel clamp a little bit, just a tiny bit. Just a little tight, perfect, perfect, that's good. Now if you le leave a little loose to it, what you can do is attach your first telescopic rod and those have to be slid from the top. So let's bring our first. And that will be strut number one. So we're going to add the number one to it. And you can see we have these little color-coded tabs that go on top. There you go. And then we're going to attach it where it should go, down there. And these, this particular system, and I'll show you with another ring in a second, uh, shows the position of the, the struts with little, little geometric shapes. So let's put a shoulder bolt back there. Let's tighten it. That's good. So in this particular system, once the telescopic struts are secured, the rods do not spin. Only the mechanism does. So you have to make sure that your patient can still see the numbers that are right there. So by putting a single strut after a half pin, what you have the luxury to adjust the position of the ring in the other plane. I'll ask my assistant actually to lock, when I'm happy with the position, to lock the strut in place. And now, we're relatively stable, right? There's a little play, however, um, I'm close to being locked in the position of the ring. So let's tighten fully this bolt while I hold the ring. Perfect. And now, we're a bit more secure. So we're going to position all of the other struts for now, one by one. While my assistant does this, let's examine those rings a little bit. So I took another ring here, this is a 180 ring. And what you can see is that the master tab is identified by these three little shapes, a circle, 
a square and a triangle. The master tab is always on the proximal ring and is always facing forward. On the distal ring, this tab should go to the back, which means that the anti-master tab is the one with only a single square. The strut positions are also marked by these shapes. This particular system gives a certain leeway in the way you position the struts. So by design, by default, the struts need to position straddling those shapes, which means that I would put strut number one right here and strut number two right, right there. So one and two. However, I have the luxury as well to position the struts up to two holes farther if I tell the computer system. So those are all my options for strut positioning. I'll continue helping my assistant reposition these struts in a W shape by alternating their position. You notice my assistant is being very careful to place the numbers visible. Notice that we're using a mix of medium struts and small struts to allow for the deformity where the, ex the lateral portion is farther away and the middle portion is closer together. I think I mentioned earlier that the that the strut need to straddle the square but it's it's inaccurate. Uh, the struts need to straddle the triangles on the ring. Now that all the stick struts are positioned, what we did is we kept those struts loose while you're positioning it to avoid imparting any kind of deformity on that ring. And if you notice, we haven't locked them. They're still loose. There were locked them at the end before we're done. But now our ring is orthogonal to the, to the bone. The struts are positioned. So now we have the luxury to think about where we would position the half pins or the shen screws uh, outside of the way of, the, uh, of these struts. Now these struts are always posi positioned in an alternating fashion, if you notice, in this W shape. And that's what creates its stability. They were positioned mostly in standard position, except here at the top where we went one hole outside of the standard position. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to, put, to place a bolt directly on the ring at the top of that ring. And then we're going to place a last one at the top immediately. So now we're going to take our drill sleeve. And it's really, it's very important to be centered in the bone. We want to be as bicortical as possible in, uh, in the tibia when we do that. So I would mark the skin, make an incision, take a hemostat and dissect down bluntly and put the um, drill sleeve where it should be. So I'm placing my drill, palpating the edges of the bone through the skin, making sure that I'm centered and insert that second chain screw. Now 
Let's turn it around a little bit. All right. So now that we have a few threads outside, all we have left to do is tighten that nut. Now for our last spin, we are going to use another of these swiveling clamp, but we'll show you one of the features that this particular system allows us to do, and it's to insert an angled pin um, where we want. Once again, this particular example does not have a soft, t soft tissues, but we want to avoid that lateral compartment. We want to avoid the muscle. So when inserting half pins, it's always good to go in the subcutaneous border of the tibia. Alternatively, you could also use a wire. Although wires create a lot of friction and diaphysis, you can avoid muscle and transfixing the muscle by doing a medial face wire, which is a wire that is parallel to the medial border of the tibia. We are not going to do that here. We're going to use another pin, and we want to be as close to 60, 60 degrees as possible. So we are going to insert it here. Let's take two nuts, and this one will keep very long. We have a lot of spread in our pins. And this pin, we are this time going to insert with an angle because the system allows us to do it and because it increases stability of the construct. So I clamp it in and once again I try to be bicortical and to avoid any structure. So this seems like a good angle. Make sure, and this pin has to be bicortical because if it's the last pin of the construct, if it becomes unicortical, it, it puts your patient at risk of a uh, fracture. Flip it over. So this would simulate the fluoroscopy view in which I would be able to see when my pin becomes bicortical. Very good. So now you can see from the top that there's a good angle between our pins at least 60 degrees, which makes it a stable construct. We have three pin fixation. This one is as well oblique in another plane, which increases the stiffness. So this is a very stable ring. Now, let's remember our distal ring only has two points of fixation. So I would like to add another one. So what we're going to do is we'll use a pin fixation bolt. We have to be mindful that the um, tibialis anterior will be there. So we want to be slightly medial to the tibialis anterior here. All right. We're going to use our sleeve. So once again, I have to be mindful about the uh, presence of the tibialis anterior muscle or tendon that is going to be in the way. We want to make sure we're medial to it. Now, the pin has to be very close to the ring because the apex of the deformity is very close to the joint. So to avoid too much translation, we want, it, we want it to be as close as possible. So we make our small incision, we displace the tibialis anterior, make sure that we're not entrapping it. Perfect. So now that we have a stable construct in an intact bone, what you could do is 
cut those pins with a with a bolt cutter and then you would lock all these struts in position and in this particular system you do that by just moving these top knobs All right, now it's all done. So once those are positioned, all you have to do is lock them in place by turning these colorful knobs. Now, it is very important at this stage to tell the computer what represents the initial deformity. And we make it as a habit to record all the numbers that are written with this in place because when we will perform the osteotomy we will have for ease of, uh, of uh, performing the osteotomy we'll have to unhook all these from the fixator and the problem is that with this particular fixator when you unhook the, the telescopic strut from the ring they start spinning freely so to avoid that what has to be done is I would give to an unscrubbed assistant the size of the rods of the telescopic struts and all the numbers. Strut number one is a medium and it's a medium at 159. So now that we have all the numbers we could disengage the struts, flip them out of the way and allow us to do a nice percutaneous osteotomy using a multiple drill hole technique and an osteotome at the desired level. Here I will do the osteotomy as close as possible to the spin, about one to one centimeter and a half away from the spin to avoid having too much translation as the apex of the deformity is very low, close to the physis or close to the joint. Okay. In this particular example, because we're working on a sawbone, I'm going to use an oscillating saw for convenience. But I would always advise in a real patient to avoid the thermal uh, injury of an oscillating saw and using a drill to create a dotted line through a single incision, obviously, and an osteotome. Alternatively, you could use a jiggly saw inserted from medial to lateral and lateral to medial to perform both the osteotomy of the fibula and the tibia at the same time. So we're actually going to do um, the multiple drill technique but through the, the, the telescopic struts. Once again, in a clinical patient, you would disengage these struts from the bottom ring to allow your fluoroscopy an unobstructed view. In this situation, we tend to forget we are having a patient, but uh, you want to be able to do your incision where there's no vital structure, so we're going to go anteromedial. So let's hold this fixer right there. And we're going to do our osteotomy very close to that first spin. So by doing so, what I do is I do a straight tap. I would come all the way out, wipe the flutes from my, from my drill, go back into the same hole and reorient my drill slightly while rotating and do a second far hole. And I would redo that a, mo a few times. until I have a, a nice dotted line. And you could as well go through the same incision and try to do another entry point. Perfect. Now we're going to take the chisel and just connect the dots one by one under fluoroscopy. So we're finishing our osteotomy here. And to ensure completion of your osteotomy, you really have to unhook these telescopic struts. Otherwise, 
your construct will be too stiff to really make sure that the fracture is complete. We'll go all the way back to the back cortex, making sure not to plunge, not to injure any structures in the back. There you go. So osteotomy is complete now, and you can confirm completion of the osteotomy on x-ray when there's translation that occurs at the fracture site. And when you see, com when you see translation, you know that the osteotomy is complete. Now, once the osteotomy is done and you unhooked your struts and you want to make sure that you reattach the struts exactly in the right place at exactly the same numbers because that recreates your baseline deformity to correct. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go to a computer, open the program, and uh, take some x-rays. And what we'll do is we will show you how the software works to correct this deformity in this particular bone. So now we're going to explore the software with which you can cr create the deformity correction program. Just open your favorite internet browser, type in fixmyleg.com, log into your account, and start a new case. You would write the case number that you that you like. Here I usually like to enter the um, patient's medical record number, and you can write a case name. Pick your favorite case name. Here we'll call it distal tibia correction. Then you pick the anatomy that you want to correct, the side, and you can include any notes that you want. Uh, you could have, for instance, measured preoperatively the magnitude of the deformity and include the amount of varus you want to correct in or the uh, the amount of procurvatum and length that you want to obtain. And then you have two choices. You can either do a preoperative planning to plan a, and to pre-build the fixer that you want, or you can do a post-operative planning. In this situation, we're going to do a post-operative planning. It brings you to the deformity uh, parameter definition page. You have two choices. You can either input the deformity parameters that you have and dial in the, the, the deformity plane, or you can go into the deformity wizard and enter your images. Select the x-rays of your choice. and then do the same thing on the medial lateral plane. Remember that you wanna take your reference x-rays as perpendicular as possible to the reference ring. Then you click next and you can calibrate your x-rays according to your magnification marker. You can use a circle or a line. I find it easier to use Align even if you're using a circle. And input the size of your magnification marker. In this situation, it's one inch or 25.4 millimeters. Then you press Next, and you can narrow down your x-ray to only contain your fixer and the area that you want to keep. And then you're left with this, where the software superimposes the x-ray that you have with a dowel of a tibia. All you have to do then is rotate your x-ray and superimpose as best you can your area of concern. You want to do this for both x-rays. 
and try to be as accurate as possible. Then you choose your reference fragment, in this case proximal, and you can dial in the deformity apex. In this case, the deformity apex is very close to the joint and the plane of the osteotomy, in this case, about a centimeter and a half away from the joint. You can dial in the amount of varus until it matches your deformity. In this case, we had about 17 degrees of varus. No translation, no apex. And to be able to disengage the fragments while you correct the deformity, you always want to input a little bit of lengthening. In this case, the way we describe, we do not describe what you want to obtain, but you want to describe what the deformity is. So here we'll input 10 millimeter of shortening. When you're happy with the result, all you have to do is finish. And decide if you want to correct axial deformity first, meaning that the software will lengthen the bone first and then correct the, the, the angular deformity or not. In this case, I'd rather not do that. Then you choose the size of your reference ring. Here we picked a full 155 millimeter aluminum ring. And you can measure, once again, digitally, the offset of your of the fixator compared to the origin of the deformity. So you would have to rotate your x-rays and align these red dowels as accurately as possible to the inferior corner of your x-rays. There's always a little bit of a margin of error. Then here, this particular system considers the origin to be really the distal tip of the proximal fragment not to be confused with the nomenclature of other systems. So you would repeat these steps for both AP views and lateral views until you're happy with the result. And then you press 10. So by doing so, the software will calculate the position of the ring compared to your bone. Then you can decide as well without using the x-rays, if you have measured with intraoperative x-rays, you can measure those parameters on your software. You input the size of the moving ring. Here, once again, it was a full 155 millimeter aluminum ring, and you press next. Then you would input the parameters of all the struts that you position on your fixator during uh, surgery, both their size and their numbers. Once this is done, to synchronize your fixator with the construct, you would click Calculate Moving Ring Position. You also have the option, if you used custom holes, to modify the whole location of your fixator, depending on what was used here. And then press next. Then you will determine the limiting anatomical structure. This is the structure, whether it's a neurovascular structure or um, the cortex of the bone, that we have the maximal distraction rate. In this case, because we're working at a tibia, we elected 0 0.75 um, millimeter per day. You position it on the dowel according to where the structure is. Here in this particular situation, we could identify the posterior tibial nerve. And put it at the tarsal tunnel. And then you, you calculate the correction time. And it gives you a correction time. You can either decide to keep that correction time, or you can override it. However, you have to be mindful that by decreasing the correction time, you can injure the, limiting, the, the limiting anatomical structure, or you can lengthen the program. You have to be mindful though of premature consolidation if you do that. You press next and you create a schedule. You can decide if your schedule 
will contain one, two, three, or four corrections per day. And you can even set these multiple corrections at specific times. And the software will create a schedule, a little bit like this one. The beauty of this software is that it gives you the, pro the software either in terms of number changes or amount of clicks per session. The software will also color. The software will also put color where stretch changes need to be done and gives you a time span to do those changes. If during your follow up you decide that the correction is not going the way you would like, you can click revise study and perform a residual program on the day that the follow up appointment falls. When you're happy with your schedule, you can continue, print it, and submit it to the patient. You obtain the summary of the software that describes in details the deformity definition, the reference ring, the moving ring, strut configuration, limiting anatomical structure, and correction time. It also tells you when strut changes need to be done so you can schedule your patient for follow-up accordingly. You can also print a PDF for the surgeon and a PDF for the patient. The PDF for surgeon includes all this, the whole summary of the fixator, as well as the, as the schedule, as well as the schedule. Whereas the patient PDF only contains the schedule. We advise printing both of these PDFs and scanning them into your patient's chart. So now that we've seen how the software works, what I suggest we test this program back on camera and we obtain the deformity correction. All right, so we are well on our way toward the deformity correction. You can see that it's taken shape. However, strut number three needs to change from a short strut to a medium strut. What's important to know about these circular hexapod external fixators is because of their conformation and because of the rotating hinges, if you remove a single strut, you lose complete stability of the frame or the fixator. So you can either use another strut to brace while you change the other one, or you can use a temporary external fixator uh, like we're going to do right here. So strut number three needs to change. We're going to apply these two rods on the fixator and we're going to secure them with nuts. I'm going to make them tight enough so that it doesn't move, but not too tight that you struggle to remove them. Then we're going to attach those using these clamps. And finally, this carbon fiber bar. Now we tighten everything. And if you make it finger tight, that should be enough to prevent any motion. The next step is to take your wrenches disengage the strut from the top first and from the bottom. Taking great care to keep the little color number in place. And we're just going to slide the new strut that we already set to the right number in its place. Now, those telescopic struts tend to spin when they're not engaged to the bottom part, so you may have to spin it if you lost your, no your number until you reach the right number. 
and re-engage it. Make sure that the numbers are nice and visible for your patient or their family members. And then you can tighten the strut again. It may sound obvious, but never forget to remove your bracing strut or your bracing external fixator. Otherwise, it will prevent any further deformity correction to occur. And the strut change is done. Now, we have one more strut change to do. We'll do it off camera and uh, we'll be back when our final deformity correction is complete to show you the end result. Now we're done with the correction. You can see that we applied a little bit of distraction to be able to disengage the fragment. However, what you can nicely see is that the articular surface is now perpendicular to the, the shaft, to the diaphysis. So we have an LDT of about 90 degrees, which is what we're aiming for. Now, if you're unhappy with this distraction, or if your patient has a leg length difference, you can always run a residual program and apply a little bit of compression or even more distraction if you need more length. But this is the power of a circular external fixator to correct a distal tibia deformity with a supramalarial osteotomy.